Well, good afternoon, good afternoon again. I'm, uh, I'm switching things up a bit, you know, with these. I'm doing them whenever I'm in the car. Whenever I've got anything to say, which isn't every day. But anyway, I went to my nose thing, and uh, <laughs> he says, reflexively sniffing, sniffing through his nose. I can't do um, forward-looking video for this. I'll put some forward-looking video in from another day. You won't. So they won't match. It won't match, but anyway. Give you something to look at. That's because I take the uh, memory chip out of the uh, overhead camera of an evening to uh, download the CC, the, you know, the driving cam footage um, to match the, the uh, camera footage. But uh, and then I've this morning I forgot to put it back in again. Ha! <laughs> Idiot. So uh, so what can I tell you? Well, basically the the doctor said and they've referred me under the two week rule. The doctor said uh, you've got to go along to see dermatology and they'll do like do a biopsy or whatever. So but when I went there, I, well, it was just ended up seeing the practice nurse who basically just took me through you know, whatever questions I'd already answered at the doctors and but she took a picture of my nose. So and she was sort of, you know, if it's a basal cell carcinoma and I was thinking, well if it's a basal cell carcinoma I should be somewhat upset. But uh, because I'm on the two week referral I think they're gonna get in touch with me in the next day or so and let me know uh, what what's what because um, that's just uh, letting a lorry out. Yeah, so I don't want to end up with a skin graft on my nose. Ideally, ended up looking like Jimmy Durante. You won't know who that is. So anyway, Piers, Piers Morgan is still on the telly, still on the telly again this morning, saying really not for list of things that you need an authority to do. You know, arguing that you need uh, the authority of a vaccine passport to be able to do pretty much anything in life. So he's still pushing it, and they still. They haven't got anybody on with the mental faculties available to uh, argue with him. He really does. He pushes at an open door on that program. I don't think they would like the you know they don't like the idea of anyone um, who can match him intellectually, which is probably the majority of the thinking population. But but they don't like those sort of people going on and making him look an idiot. So they tend to just match him up with people who agree with him, or at least won't argue with him, you know, or, or really don't understand enough about the issue to argue with him. So, but then that's the media these days. It's all a central line they take. A, they have a narrative, don't they? They have a central line to take, and uh, and that's what they do. They don't stray off it too much. So. had a young lad, for those of you who are looking perhaps for a bit of an insight into how private practice works, we had a lady ring up yesterday, uh, it, was, it might have been the day before yesterday, or it might have been yesterday, anyway, remembering when your patients come in is not one of the things that you do as a private dentist, that's the first thing you need to know. Anyway, it's a, it's a woman with a seven-year-old son, uh, not living in the best part of uh, Margate. Um, one of these, uh, one of these women that's um, probably got two jobs, you know, and uh, has to take time off work to bring her son in. He's screaming and crying because he's got toothache, 
So of course we see them straight away. We don't. Right. Lou knows my nurse. There's never a discussion about seeing a child. Really, it doesn't matter whether it's on our day off and we both have to come back to the surgery, or whether it's we're working and, and we have to see them in our lunch hour or put them on the end of the session or whatever. That children in pain just tend to get top priority. Um, and they need to, they need to get top priority from us because, um, to be honest with you, they don't get top priority from the surgeries, the NHS surgeries where they're registered. Sorry, I've got to do that to get the light out of my eyes. So, um, anyway, it turns out he's got like seven decayed teeth. He's got, his lower incisors are through, but otherwise he's got E to E and there's a ton of decay between the D's and the E's mainly on the top left which is where it's painful so um, so on the first visit we just like concentrate on establishing a rapport and I uh, tried to plaster a bit of um, uh, zinc oxide eugenol in the gap between the D and the E on the end of my finger because I don't really want to do any I don't want to do any drilling or even any excavating at this point and uh, Tooth's obviously hypersensitive if he's screaming with pain from it. She's got him dosed up with uh, Calpol. Uh, she's rung 9 NHS 111. And they've told her, in addition to Calpol, to give him ibuprofen. And uh, anyway, when he came in, he actually looked quite cheerful when I saw him. But as I say, we put a temporary filling in and then. I'm anticipating that, you know, she's going to, he's, he's going to be, for his routine care, he's probably going to be seeing he's an NHS dentist. Um, but, um, but the thing is, we fitted him in as an emergency, and we didn't make any charge, right? So, we do that, we did that on a pro bono basis. Uh, it's not entirely disinterested because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to um, build up a relationship between myself and, and the boy and the mum uh, to the point where should she decide to bring him to see us and, I've, and, and it turns out that if you do this properly they would they'll move heaven and earth to bring the child to see you especially if the child's not um, had a good experience or has had no experience or has been turned away elsewhere because uh, you know they say to the child now did you like the dentist and the child said yeah yeah he's like as the French say Sampa he's, he's okay he's you know he's nice you know uh, he was funny or whatever and so the parents then because they want to get the child into treatment they'll tend to obviously favour a dentist who has built up a rapport with the child and, and that the child is, is all quite happy and even possibly looks forward to going to see because he knows he's going to get a balloon, he knows he's going to get some stickers, etc, etc. Nothing really terrible has happened to him, at least so far. So, um, also, there's the consideration of um, uh, the pain, the pain element, because let's say the woman uh, rings up and she says I've got a seven year old screaming his head off in pain and uh, I need to bring him in to see you so you're like okay um, and then you, you do exactly the same treatment right you sit down you have a chat you get you know you, you count their teeth up uh, and you put some zinc oxide eugenol in the cavity and that and then you turn around at the end and you say well it's um it's 25 quid for the checkup, children's checkup, and it's uh, 15 pound for the temporary filling, right? And then um, <clears throat> later that day, after the patient's gone, the mum rings up again and said, "You know, uh, Mrs. Sanso, I came in to see you this morning. Yes, um, you know, I paid you 40 pounds. Yes. Well, the filling's fallen out, and uh, he's still screaming his head off with pain." So, so in other words, you know, so much, so much for what you did, you know, 
so much for charging me 40 quid for not solving the problem, you know? Uh, so you're not gonna get off to a really good start with a parent's life that on, that, on that basis. So what we did was, we just said to the mum, look, there's no charge. All we've done, and we haven't really done much, I mean, we've come in, had a chat, we've wrote down what teeth he's got, done his medical history and everything, Squirt, squidged a bit of zinc oxide eutanol in the hole, and, and told her that we'd be in touch, you know. Um, and sure enough, sure enough, and this only really comes from experience, okay? You can't really know what's gonna blow up until you've had 40 years of things blowing up on you. And you just get like a sixth sense for uh, what's gonna, you know, what, what it would be better if you didn't charge for. Because you have to sort of think to yourself, if this doesn't work, right? If I charge for it and it doesn't work, where is that going to leave me? And the answer is with a young child who's in severe pain and a mother who's got no money who's just had to pay you half the weekly food budget uh, and not really had a solution. It leaves you in a very, on a sticky wicket, doesn't it? It leaves you in a difficult place. So we said to the mum, look, there's no charge. And, and that in itself is raises a few eyebrows in a good way because they're, they're like, you know, oh, you know, surely I must owe you some money for this. Uh, you know, I've rung around every other dentist and not only were they were they going to charge me, but they couldn't see him either. Um, and uh, now here I am, here you are, this dentist, like, who not only can see him and he's nice to him, but hasn't, but says they're not really bothered about the money, you know? They're not, they don't really want a load of money. Uh, for, for, for getting a child out of pain. So it makes you feel good. Uh, well, it makes you feel good, yeah. <laughs> you know, you do get the odd twinge where you think, you know, if I, if I wasn't like this, I would be driving a better car than I am. But, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the feeling that you get from driving a Porsche is nothing compared to the feeling you get from getting a seven-year-old child out of pain so and that's you know or, or it might be the other way around for you but it's definitely that way for me I'd rather do the pro bono work and drive around in a crappy old Peugeot so <laughs> with 96,000 miles on the clock uh, so anyway sure enough she rings up and she says uh, you're, still, you're still in a lot of pain so I said well and she'd rung NHS, what's it? And I said, yeah, you can alternate the painkillers. She said, can I bring him back to see you tomorrow if it's no better? So I said, of course, you know, no, no problem. So, and again, that's, in a private practice, we have like half an hour a day. We have actually half an hour a session. We have between uh, 10, 30 and 11, I think, and 4 to 4.30 for emergencies. Um, in the morning one session we use for a coffee break. If it's not filled up in the afternoon one, it's almost never filled up. We use it for sterilising so we can go home about half past four. So, anyway, sure enough, she rings up this morning. He's had another bad night. Can I bring him in? Yeah, fair enough. What does he need? Well, he's probably going to need some antibiotics, isn't he? Because by, by the time, you know, bearing in mind this child is pretty uh, chirpy and, and fully red. You know, it's not, you know what people look like who are in pain. They're white as a sheet, aren't they? They're sipping water out of a bottle. They're, um, they look like really, really, like they haven't slept. This child's chirpy as anything when he comes in. Uh, very smiley, very inquisitive, asking loads of questions. What's that, what's that? Anyway, um, so uh, I gave her some, uh, I said, because he's over seven, he can actually have 500 milligrams of Amoxil three times a day, and we've got it in capsule form. So I would have given it to her, but she said she wanted it in uh, uh, liquid form. So we don't have that. You can't actually get that, I don't think, from dental directory or whatever. Uh, so, um, anyway, we wrote a private prescription, and she's gonna take that to Margate. And once again, we didn't charge her. Because, you know, we, you know, uh, and she said that the filling fell out 
in the car on the way home. Now, that's entirely possible, right? Entirely possible. All I did was dry out the, the cavity with a cotton wool and um, paste some, some pretty liquid zinc oxide in. The child is immediately sort of went to it with his tongue. And the mum, as soon as she went out the door, she said, is it, can he eat on it straight away? And I said yes, thinking, how quickly is, gonna, is he going to be able to eat? I mean, and for all I know, that as soon as he got in the car, she gave him like a fruit loop or something, or a bag of jelly babies, to reward him for going to the dentist. And that's what pulled the filling out. Or it maybe licked it out, or maybe it was a bit high on the bite, and, and when he bit on it, it just broke and came out. So I'll never know. Anyway, the point is it came out. So today she's saying to me, can you put the filling back in? You know, yesterday you said it was a good idea to have the filling in and it's fallen out so obviously it will be a good idea to put it back in. And I said, no, because it fell out. And the thinking behind that is that there's no point reinforcing failure. If you've put the filling in and it's, it's fallen out, then the chances are if you do another one, that'll fall out as well. And there's, so there's absolutely no point at all uh, wasting time doing a filling that's that, that you know already has fallen out. I mean, obviously, this is based on the fact that you did it properly. You're pretty confident you did it reasonably properly to start off with. And so, no, so I'm like, no, okay. Uh, you know, well, you said that he might need a, I explained all about polypotomies and stuff. She might, he might need a filling, basically, she said. Can you do the filling today? Because I have to take half a day off work. Every time I bring him half a day off work, and I said no because um, first of all we've got to give him an injection he's seven years old this is only the second time he's been in here we're getting on well but I'm not at all sure that he can tolerate a double colpotomy on the spot not to mention the fact that we only had half an hour uh, and I said and his tooth is probably hypersensitive you know she said she thinks his face is swelling up a bit I said that would be a good thing because if his face did swell up then at least the pain would go uh, the antibiotics will, uh, she said, will the antibiotics take the pain away? So I said, no, I'll take the infection away. And if the infection is causing the pain, then that, that'll take the, the, the pain away. But I'm not going to do a temporary filling, and I'm not going to do a, a Philly's teeth today, but I am going to give him some antibiotics. Anyway. Gave her a prescription. Our, our prescription template is not... Um, correct because for, for a child you need to have their date of birth on the uh, prescription so she takes the prescription into uh, Boots in Margate who uh, do their best not to dispense it by not not you know they don't ring me up and just say oh you know you've left the date of birth off if you could tell me the date of birth I can write it on and we'll dispense it oh no no they, they rather leave a seven-year-old in pain than, than to work out a way to to do something, right? This is this is just inconceivable. I just can't understand this mentality, right? So <clears throat> she rang me up and she said, "Look, you know, uh, can I come in and get a new prescription because they won't won't dispense this prescription?" So I said, "Look, I'll what I'll do is because it's our fault, I'll get it dispensed." and I'll drop it around. Oh, no, no, no need to do that. I said, look, it's on our way home. No, it's not on our way home. But basically, someone needs to take ownership of this problem and get it sorted out. So we went down local boots, me and Lou. Uh, I wrote the prescription out properly, signed it. Uh, oh, yeah, no, I had one of those in this morning, but we used it, so we haven't got any. Okay, get back in the car, go over Sainsbury's uh, Pharmacy. Sainsbury's Pharmacy is shut, two to three. You can't ring anywhere. I rang Boots, uh, the, the, the local branch. They, they're not picking up the phone. I rang Boots Customer Service in Nottingham. They're not picking up the phone. We rang Sainsbury's to see if they had it. They're not picking up the phone because obviously they're shut. So we go over Tesco's uh, and, yeah, sure enough, they've got it and they'll dispense it, but it'll take 20 minutes. And I'm like, really? You know, this, this is a bottle of a gloop that cost £1.97 on the NHS. That's the tariff. Cost them less. 
And um, but for some reason, I can pick up a packet of bacon and get and buy it in Sainsbury's in thirty seconds. But you pick up a bottle of medicine and it and it has to take twenty minutes. So anyway, so we just stand around for twenty minutes, and then eventually we got it. I think it's four pound thirteen in the end. And this is a, this is actually a tip. You can get a lot of um, antibiotics, especially the penicillins and the erythromycins and things prescribed much cheaper privately than, than you can on the NHS. Especially if you go to somewhere like Tesco's or Sainsbury's, you know. Uh, and then what happened? We jumped in the car and we drove around the patient's house and we dropped it off, all, all dispensed up. So, and, and she's highly delighted uh, at the service, you know, because she's had two visits, loads of good advice, a temporary filling, someone's been nice to her son, and we've literally dropped off the uh, the medicine to her, to her doorstep. And uh, so far, that's all been free of charge, all been free of charge. And in, in return, probably, we're going to end up doing two pole potteries, out of which we're going to make 130 quid uh, in total. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of goodwill. We're just generating a lot of goodwill, a lot of word of mouth. That's hopefully, she'll go and say, do you know what, you know, that dentist, he was, you know, he really went the extra mile with my son to you know because he was in a lot of pain and i could see that she was really distressed and solving this problem was a big win for her you know she really cares about her son she doesn't want him to be up screaming at three o'clock in the morning i don't want her to be up at three o'clock in the morning having to listen to him scream um and um this is what we do at the end of the day we're dentists this is this is the problem that we're supposed to solve you know and that's the way i solved it by, with a little bit of a you know we ended up paying for the prescription, £4.13, you know, it's not the end of the world. So we absorbed a bit of cost and did a good deed, our good deed for the day, as I said to Lou. So, but that is that is a difference between a private dentist and an NHS dentist. The NHS dentist would probably would not see that child, wouldn't even see them. Um, and certainly wouldn't have, wouldn't, wouldn't get anywhere near to providing the service level that, that we've provided. Now, I'm not trying to say this to sort of big up me or, or, the, or the practice or anything, but I mean, I'm just trying to, I'm just explaining this as, this is how dentistry could be. It could be like that, you know? It could be like that. If it was run properly and uh, preventively and there was less disease, re repeat restorative work and, uh, and, and, and uh, proper preventive systems put in place to cut down on the amount of dental disease, we, we would have far more dentists who would be freed up to do stuff like that. Anyway, I'm home now, so I'm going to go and say hello to the wife, and uh, I will talk to you soon. Bye.